Welcome to another special video presentation brought to you by the American Bankruptcy Institute. I am ABI's editor-at-large, Bill Rochelle, and we are coming to you from the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges in Las Vegas, Nevada, the city in which our guest, Bruce Markell, was for nine years a U.S. bankruptcy judge. Bruce is the professor of law and bankruptcy practice at the Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. And I have to keep up with Bruce because he bounces back and forth between <laughs> different uh, professions, all related to the law. He came out of law school, number one of his, in his class at the UC Davis Law School, and clerked for uh, now Justice Anthony Kennedy when he was on the Ninth Circuit. That was followed by a stand in private practice, among other things, as a partner at Siddeley in Austin. Uh, then I think in academia, then on the bench, and now back in academia. Okay, I'm, I'll figure out what I want to be when I grow up, when I grow up. Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Professor, stay in academia <laughs> because you can write more interesting stuff than when you were on the bench. I mean, your opinions were interesting on the bench, but. Now you can write what you want to, not what you have to. Uh, one of the reasons why I left, yes. Well, in talking about uh, writing things that you, you want to, I understand that you were involved as an amicus in the FDI case in the Supreme Court dealing with uh, whether the 546E safe harbor applies when a bank is merely a, uh, a mere conduit. That's the Seventh Circuit's wording, certainly. I mean, yeah, I, I joined an amicus with Ralph Brubaker uh, and others, uh, Mark Rowe, um, and a number of others who believe the Seventh Circuit, uh, if they didn't get it right, they at least ought to be affirmed. Uh, 546E has been stretched, I think, kind of beyond where people thought it should have gone when it originally came into the code. So what has it become? Um, basically a shelter for anybody who wants to put up a defense to a constructively fraudulent transfer claim. For example, an LBO came, I mean, and FTI is a fairly decent example. The only, the 546E is meant to protect the integrity of the securities market and the securities clearing market. The idea was that if you have kind of avoidance powers actions at some point, um, that can gum it up. Um, but that was thought of where you actually had, if you will, real defendants as, uh, players in the securities industry. What's happened now is because of the language that uh, has been used and amended, uh, the financial intermediaries <coughs> include just the banks who are acting as the escrow agent for a uh, funds transfer. And so if you in fact can show that someone before you in line for the payments, for example on a leveraged buyout, uh, was a bank, you have a shield. And I think that's not what the statute originally intended. Uh, for sure. And also I think uh, the Seventh Circuit gives a, a, a plausible explanation of how you get there by looking at the language, because 546E is not exactly the best drafted statute. It incorporates a lot of kind of more or less abstruse uh, definitions. But at the end of the day it's a question of whether or not that people by just structuring a transaction, by getting uh, the status or the identity of certain people to be financial institutions can avoid fraudulent transfer liability. And that's, at the end of the day, not right. Do you think this is going to be a case where the Supreme Court tells us about limitations on the plain meaning defense? Or do you think they're just going to run through with plain meaning? Or what are their options? Um, well, it's interesting. I mean, the Seventh Circuit is really kind of an outlier. I mean, you've got the Third Circuit, you've got the Second Circuit, although there's a, a pending case. It's not been pending. Cert's been pending for over a year, I believe, uh, involving a similar issue under 544. Um, and I think the Supreme Court will probably just say, yeah, it's plain. We read it this way. If someone wants to fix it, go to Congress and, and get it fixed. Yeah. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I, I don't think that there is a coherent plain meaning canon. I think. Well, yes, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, frankly, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, it's not coherent because I think each individual justice has his or her own view on it. Uh, but on this one, where you know, as an Article Three judge, you're going to get able advocates on each side saying, "Of course, this is what it means." Um, unless, unless you've got a lot of help to work your way through it, it's kind of hard to figure 
uh, yeah. where I think I think it should come out. Well, another area in which you have a bee in your bonnet is equitable mootness. So what's going on there? Um, equitable mootness, I've been writing on and off and on for a while and hope to do something um, uh, at, at a, a seminar and conference coming up. Equitable mootness, again, is one of these items that's a little bit odd in the sense that it was always the case that an appeal would be moot equitably if there was no relief that could be granted. The trouble is when you import bankruptcy in its kind of um, class action aspects, that is to say, equitable mootness applies in a normal appeal um, when you've got two parties. But here, any appeal from a confirmation is really the wrong party against all the rest of the creditor body. And so the normal way in which you protect against an appeal that may go wrong is to say, okay, you post a bond to kind of cover the other person's costs. Well, the other person in bankruptcy is the whole creditor body. Uh, in the Tribune case, for example, um, there was a request for a stay of the reorganization on the grounds that the bankruptcy court had gotten the confirmation wrong. And the court said, fine, you get a stay, just put up a billion and a half dollar bond. Yes. I'm not even sure you can buy a billion and a half dollar bond, but that kind of situation of the, the loan wronged creditor, by definition, against the whole creditor body is something that hasn't really been looked at, and that's one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm hoping to kind of well, piece apart. You know, you may have a chance because uh, I was told that that issue is going to be raised in response to a cert petition in the Sunny Slope case. Uh, Sunny Slope itself uh, doesn't involve equitable mootness, but instead uh, the respondent is promised to file a response saying that the Supreme Court, if it grants certiorari, should also review the equitable mootness doctrine. Yeah, I, I, the Supreme Court needs to review equitable mootness. They had a great opportunity in the Tribune case and turned it down. There is, I mean, if you look for circuit conflicts, the circuits are, there's at least four or five different standards used by six or seven different circuits. Well, but one thing though, it used to be if a plan was consummated, slam, bam, dismissed, period, right. no thought given to it. But in the last five years, the last two in particular, there's been a lot of circuit law that's trimming back on it. So it strikes me that this doctrine is in flux so much that I'm not sure this is the time for the Supreme Court to get involved. I mean, there's a good argument to say let, let it develop up more through the circuits. The trouble is that there are now, I mean, I've, I've looked at all kind of 11 circuits. There really are it will take a long time to get some form of coherent, cohesive doctrine together. And so the counter argument to that is that since there's so much money at stake, this is something the Supreme Court should really step in. It may matter more that there's a rule and that the rule is right. Yeah, well, I guess. Now, another thing, Professor, uh, whenever I'm trying to find you, more likely than not, you're, you're not in the country. You're somewhere else. Well, that has so, nothing, to, nothing, to, <laughs> nothing to do with criminal law. I'll just so no. state that <laughs> right point. now. Good point. But uh, you are uh, always involved with uh, international law in Chapter 15. What's going on there these days? Um, there's a lot going on. Uh, first start, I mean, I just got back uh, from Insol Europe last week. I was in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, I was asked to give the Shakespeare Martinow lecture on the fact that last November the uh, European Commission issued a directive that all member states in the European Union will have to change their laws to meet certain minimum reorganization standards, which is a big step forward for the European Union. There is 28 states in the EU now, um, 28 different laws. How to kind of reconcile them so that you have a common market is going to be very, very interesting. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of reversed. Normally, you know, the U.S., the United States can, can take a page out of the history from Europe. This is reversed. They should take a page out of our history. We've been doing reorganization for a lot longer, and a lot of their proposals uh, are problematic in that respect. Well, now, I understand also that stuff is going on out in the, uh, the Far East. Yes, Singapore is, in my view, making a move to become the reorganization center of Asia, if oh, not the oh, world. Oh, so, so in other words, the Delaware of the Pacific, is yeah, that Yeah, something the like that. I mean, they're, they're, they are um, they're streamlining their court system. They're putting in business courts. They have, I believe, a new arbitration law. They're having conferences where they're uh, inviting people from all over the world. They're putting in, they developed and are trying to push a very good set of 
protocols called the Judicial Insolvency Network protocols that courts in Hong Kong, Delaware, Southern District, New York, recently Australia, have adopted. I mean, that's a real, that's an area in which if in fact, for whatever reason, if they think that they can attract business and better their citizens by being this kind of central hub, uh, they'll, they've got the means and the resources to do it. It'll be very interesting to see what they do. Well, you know, finally, let's go back closer to home because as far as I'm concerned, your most important assignment right now is the chairman of one of the committees on the ABI Commission studying consumer law. Right. Uh, what's the committee and what are some of the issues that you are studying? Um, well, again, the Consumer Commission is a, is a grand effort sponsored uh, pr uh, by the ABI and, th and thanks to them for doing this. Um, partly or mostly the brainchild of Gene Weedoff uh, with uh, really able leadership at the top. Bob Lawless is a wonderful reporter. Um, uh, you know, Bill Brown and Liz uh, Paris, former judges, as the chairs are, are great on the commission. What the commission has organized itself into, the commission has 15 members, um, it's organized itself into three committees, a Chapter 7 committee, a Chapter 13 committee, and a committee on case administration and the estate. I'm the chair of that committee. Uh, that committee has four other commissioners but besides myself on it, plus 10 other members in the, in, from the bankruptcy committee. And we're looking at things that affect bankruptcy practice for consumers, such as um, can and if they can lawyers unbundle their services and if so under what conditions um, what are the appropriate terms for appearance counsel what are the appropriate ways in which we should look at student loans I mean ha is the law now in sync with where kind of the practice is um, w are there things we can talk about with respect to exemptions are there uh, things that we can do with respect to forms. Uh, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with some of the forms that came out. Um, can we talk about uh, how appropriately uh, repossessions can occur or surrenders? I mean, a lot of disparate topics. Again, the commission is not set up to issue a set of legislative recommendations. Given the current political climate, that would be kind of tilting at windmills, I think. At least that's my view. What we are doing, however, is looking, for example, in areas like unbundling and appearance counsel, looking for kind of best practices and trying to put down in one place so that bankruptcy judges can have access to it, so that the, the practicing bar can have access to the ideas of what the issues are and what the best way to handle these issues are. Um, and I think we can really contribute a lot, and the whole commission can contribute a lot, if in fact we kind of bring together what sometimes is thought to be 94 different consumer practices because of the 94 different federal judicial districts and hopefully you actually have a federal bankruptcy law that has one set of rules. That may be a little bit uh, ambitious, but I hopefully can do it. Well, you know, you've got a lot on your plate, but perhaps, just maybe, if the populist movement in this country uh, actually gathers some steam and actually starts advocating the interests of common people maybe there will be a chance for legislation. You know, it sure would be nice because we've been a long time in this country without any consumer protection legislation. And that's, in some ways, that's what this is. This is bankrupt consumer protection oh, legislation. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Emily Dickinson said, hope is the thing with feathers, right? Um, and, and we can always hope that, that we will have that kind of change where, in fact, people start thinking about how do we really help people, um, I mean, from my nine years on the bench, the most gratifying things were to see consumers, because again, as you know, it's the vast majority of the practice, but to see consumers being able to turn their lives around, to take care of something that was troubling them financially and be able to handle it and move on. And, because people want to be productive, they want to be helpful, they want to contribute. And sometimes the way in which debts are set up and the way debts are incurred, uh, that stops many people from doing it. And hopefully, when you've got a good consumer bankruptcy law. I mean, it's not as Dostoevsky said that you judge a, a country by its prisons, right? But maybe we judge a, a country's uh, in part by how they treat those in financial need. Well, Professor Bruce Markell, I thank you very much for your time. As usual, what you have to tell us is most insightful. And I must say, with respect to all of these uh, fingers you have, or pies you have your fingers in, 
uh, in all of them, there's a common theme, and that is you're doing God's work, and we appreciate <laughs> it. So uh, keep it up, and oh, let's thanks. come back and talk again sometime right. soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.